How is advertising going for all you seed stock producers? Seed stock producers have been promoting their bowl sale using the same method for the past 20 years, while most producers have incorporated new technology like videos, online bidding, and social media, their process is still the same. Frankly, the build it and they will come approach isn't cutting it. But here's the good news, there's a better way. The Catalyst Hybrid Media Strategy uses a multifaceted plan to engage with bull buyers and build a relationship. So when sale season does roll around, your customers know you, like your cattle, and trust your program. This elevates you above the competition and builds loyal bull buyers for years to come. And once you learn the Catalyst strategy, you will understand and be able to use these revolutionary secrets to promote your genetics year after year. If you want to spur the success of your bull sale, visit cowcamppromotions.com to learn more. And I guess the first thing I'd really like you to share with our guests are is what is your background in the ranching space? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my background really stems from my grandfather's upbringing uh, of me. Um, from a very early age, I have pictures all the way back to two years old of me getting on a horse and uh, going out and working cattle with my grandfather, you know, him taking the reins and leading me around as we push cattle. Um, and then I've spent all of my summers and all of my weekends throughout the years <clears throat> coming out here and running cattle. And at that, that time, he had quite a large uh, quarter horse operation that he was doing in conjunction with um the cattle and so i also kind of got a little bit of background in the quarter horse uh world and the cutting world of things when we went into competitions um they also did a little bit of reining uh at times but most of my experience was based in in the cattle and you know learning about the genetics and learning about the things that actually went into what makes a good cow what makes a good bull um, those types of fundamentals that a lot of, I feel, ranch kids get at an early age coming up through this type of system. Yeah, so it's it's really um, going into the genetics. It's going into what types of breeds you're using and what the intention is for the overall um, objective, right? Uh, back then, my grandfather was more concerned about growing the cow or uh, the steer out to a finished weight as quickly as possible or getting them to that 500 weight and then taking them to the sale barn or doing some type of private treaty to, to send them onto another ranch. Um, so just kind of being one of those kids that got a taste of this and really a, a passion for it as I grew up through the years. Um, you know, my summers out here were crucial, bailing hay, doing all the grunt work that, you know, nobody wants to do, but has to do to come up through the chain. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much how I got my, my background in, in ranching. So do you want to talk about your operation today and what you're all doing there? Yeah, absolutely. So just to give a little bit of context, uh, our operation was started in 1977 by my grandfather as a conventional cow-calf operation. And uh, there was a period of time between the, the end of his career with the ranch and me being in the military that the ranch kind of said dormant, if you will. Uh, and we had to sell off or titrate down on a lot of our, our cattle population, our cattle herd and our horse herd. And so in 2017, uh, I came into the picture after I got out of the military and uh, we were at a crossroads as a family and trying to decide what it was that we were going to do with the ranch to maintain its you know, annuity. And so I ended up raising my hand at that meeting and, and telling everybody, you know, this is my plan. This is how I expect to get things done. And then we retroactively uh, converted the ranch to a grass fed and finished and biodynamic uh, and sustainable operation. Um, and then subsequently getting our certifications as a gap step four operator and uh, being certified by the American grass fed association and a couple others. Um, okay. So since then, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you can continue. Oh, so since then we've been uh, moving everything up. So we're actually retaining yearlings now. We're uh, backgrounding. Uh, we've we've um, filtered out, if you will, some of that color that my grandfather had bred into to our overall herd, and it kind of looked uh, 
like a Picasso picture, <laughs> you know, at the end of 35 or 40 years. Um, so we cleaned it up, got it back to our Angus roots. And uh, now just for our growth factor, we're, we're doing a uh, Sim Angus, three quarter Sim, quarter Angus, or excuse me, reverse that three quarter Angus, quarter Sim uh, cross. So, and that's kind of where we are today to, to catch you up. Yeah. So in addition to your ranch, I mean, you have more than just the raising cattle. I mean, you're connected with consumers, you have other aspects. So what are those other diversifying factors that um, you'd still consider a part of your overall business and what you're doing today? Uh, so, yeah, well, we identified a problem early on when we started retrofitting everything over to the, the grass fed and finish side. We realized that we weren't netting necessarily what we needed to to make a profit every year at the sale barn. So identifying that was the key to um, allowing us to, I guess, assess all of our options as to where we wanted to go from here. And one of the options that we ended up going forward with um, was the direct to consumer route. So, you know, I created an entire supply chain with our cattle to where we would grow them out, we would background them. Um, you know, we would retain some, some of the, more of those heifers that were in, in line with our program that we were going into. And uh, we, in doing so, we would go to the farmer's market. We were able, we got the capability to approach restaurants, to approach grocery stores, to um, do all of those things, kind of, the typical routes that you would assume uh, with going direct to consumer. Uh, though we were kind of faced with a dilemma um, once COVID hit um, and then kind of fun, funny, uh, right before COVID hit it, at one of the farmer's markets, we ended up meeting uh, the director of the CTE programs for the Dallas Independent School District. And um, I didn't know who he was at the time. And uh, he was just kind of a guy in the crowd that was listening in on the conversation and hearing what I had to say about the cattle in our operation and how we care for our beef. And he approached me to say, hey, um, I would really appreciate it if you come out and, and help help kind of get a picture of what we're working with out here at this uh, Seagaville facility. So I said, sure. And um, from there, that blossomed into a contract where we not only went out there to consult just on the baselines of what they needed for that to be a sustainable um, cattle uh, operation on that small of an acreage, uh, but we also identified other ways to create revenue for them um, by bringing in storefronts, um, creating uh, the show, uh, working in partnership with the ranch and, and other ranches to create a pipeline of cattle and, and ruminant animals that could be used in show. So all of those kind of typical uh, check in the boxes for them that would make their program a lot more robust. But the key thing that I think that we walked away from that situation was, is that we had the ability to create blockchain curriculum. Um, and what this blockchain curriculum essentially was going to do, or still is going to do, we're still, uh, the planning process is happening uh, with, with COVID as it's kind of gone along. Um, but what has been discussed is that, you know, you would take um, one, maybe two weeks at the producer level, and these kids would go through an intensive learning program and, and see, you know, the dairy side and the beef producing side and the cow calf side, and then they would shift up and then they would see you know, what does it look like if I did decide to go to direct consumer or kind of take maybe a wholesale route or something along those lines? And then what does it look like working with a packer? And then they would be able to see the meat sciences and how to negotiate packing contracts and all of those types of things, all the way up until they got to a finished product uh, module, I'll, I'll just call it, um, to where they, you know, see how that finished product looks on the plate, how they market that, how they talk like a chef, how they cook like a chef, you know, so that they can go into any situation at any level and be knowledgeable to some degree, or at least a professional degree, um, and, and hold their own. Um, now, this was kind of a unique idea in the sense that this was, or my intention for it was to create a pathway um, to an alternative to college. So we had gotten with private equity groups. Um, one in particular that I had brought this up to is Jalen Smith from the Dallas Cowboys. Um, he has a minority entrepreneurship institute that's really big into mentoring and, and uh, lifting up people um, that want to get into business that don't necessarily maybe have the means though. So 
what would happen is that these kiddos would get to the end of this blockchain curriculum at the end of junior year or senior year these are the details that we're trying to work out with the disd as far as you know uh what are the upcoming covid restrictions you know how are how's teaching going to look is it going to be online is it going to be mostly in class it's all of these things and i think most of those have been still trying to fetter out some things um but the the part that was kind of unique to that situation is that mei uh aspect so they would essentially these kids would take one of those blockchains and create a business plan of their own for it so they they really have a affinity for meat packing or they really have affinity for a cow calf operation well then they would create their own business plan they would go and then pitch it meant like a mini shark tank in a way uh and then you know these pne guys would essentially say hey i'm gonna you know uh dictated or needed uh to be successful they'll say hey i'll i'll sponsor you in, in mentorship or we'll fund you up to a certain dollar amount or we'll fund you all the way um but essentially it gives them some type of um long-term guidance that we're not just saying hey great job guys you did uh, really good. I'm glad you found found yourself in this program. Uh, see you later. Right. We don't want that to happen because that's when people start kind of losing confidence in the ability and they face problems that they might not know how to uh, overcome in certain situations. So having that added layer of of continuity to to take them out after high school um, really lends some really unique um, perspective and really unique um, abilities to the program. Uh, so that's kind of in a nutshell what we've been working on with the DISD. Now, since COVID has happened, we've had to pivot uh, with our ranch operations and with DISD in a lot of different ways to where uh, we couldn't go on campus with the DISD. We couldn't interact with the kids. We had to do Zoom, you know, everything pretty much. Um, and our, our timelines for, for uh, everything, essentially with the, the training or teaching or however it was done, was cut in half. Uh, everything had to be faster, faster, faster. Um, and then we're, uh, we were picking up contracts with the ranch, you know, on the restaurant side of things and doing those types of things. Uh, we were losing out because then the restaurants had to shutter and the chefs no longer could cook and people couldn't go to restaurants. So in a very short amount of time, we lost a lot of our revenue base. Um, so what we did is we pivoted yet again. So we, we now have this DISD thing that we were kind of controlling all the way through COVID the best we could uh, on top of um, creating a chef collaborative uh, called Cowboys and Bohemians out here at the ranch where we took all of the chefs from Dallas or the ones will, willing to come out here and work with us uh, to the ranch, created this R&D kitchen for them uh, so that they can continue their craft and we bring people out here we host the private dinners we do things like that uh, I think one of the fun more fun things that we we did was our brunches uh, the way that works is that we pick you up from East Dallas we drive you out here and when you checked out with your your ticket you'd be able to pick one of two activities you either do a health and wellness or you do a skeet shooting so I'll take you out and you skeet shoot with me for an hour and then we come back up and you can watch the chef prepare a, a four course brunch so and then we take care of all your transportation and everything like that so it's those things that allowed us to continue normal operations but we had to remain and stay very creative and, and ingenuitive um the other things that we've been trying to do is that um since recent legislation's kind of been passed uh we've been reaching out to more international partners or potential partners uh, to see if we could accommodate or offset any of their demand uh, that they're having to face that they can't necessarily um, capture. Uh, so, you know, we've, we're working with a contract in Korea. Uh, there's one in Bahrain potentially. So these are all the kind of little caveats of what we're doing out here. Well, that's awesome. So um, there's a lot we can touch on with each one of those segments, but you guys have really done what sounds like an outstanding job of you're pivoting when needed and making sure you always have a cash flow somewhere. But going back to that CTE program, so these students you're working with, obviously, if they're in there, they're interested in ag in some space. Do all of them mm -hmm. come from ag backgrounds or a majority from non-ag backgrounds? What are the types of kids you're working with? 
So it's right now um, for COVID restrictions, it was mostly ag kids that were allowed to go to those facilities because they were already in those types of programs before and they didn't want to, I guess, inundate the facility with a bunch of people just trying to see if they liked it. Um, but the idea is is for it not to be just the ag kids, for anyone really that wants to show an interest in it. And it's across multiple CTE programs. So, you know, if, uh, you know, we touch on hydroponics, we get hydroponics CTE kids, or if we touch on uh, land management or, um, you know, ag, and then, you know, culinary gets involved as well on that finished product side of things when we're, you know, negotiating contracts with restaurants or, um, you know, talking about finished dishes and, and bringing that kind of uh, professional language into their vocabulary uh, so that they can communicate effectively on that level. Um, so, you know, I, I, that was the overall intention. I think that's why DISD really liked the idea is because it was so inclusive that any walk of life could come in here and, and get something out of it. Um, but I think that with um, you know, budgets and the coronavirus restrictions that they're going to look at it a little bit differently in the sense that they only really want people that are, are looking at this as something uh, serious and not as an inquiry. Um, they don't want you to just come out for, you know, a couple classes or whatnot or anything like that. They want you to commit. So um, typically what we've found thus far is that the people that have committed, um, or ag or they have some type of ag affinity um in their background okay so what has been like the most rewarding part for you i mean i know you're still in some of the planning stages and you've had to deal a lot with covid but what's been the most rewarding part of being able to build a program like this for youth um, well, there's a lot of things, and I think that the the largest one was being able to collaborate with the the directors of the CTEs and really get their insight as to what they were lacking, um, and then giving them a product that they can be proud of and, and put their name on, and you know, uh, allow these kids to have access to the facilities and the the uh, equipment and everything that they'll need but that DISD might not be able to provide on their own. Um, I think that giving them that ability has really um, increased my insight into how the public school system works and why it's so important to have channel partners like Happy Hollow Ranch and you know all these other, uh, like Virgin Hotels and Peter Barlow, all these, uh, these people that are involved in this program come in and, and donate their time or you know donate their equipment or whatever capacity to enhance that experience and to enhance that learning um, is the most rewarding for me. So outside of the COVID challenges, what were some of the other challenges that you faced? Um, I think budgetary challenges, justifying certain things and making sure that the program was built out the way it needed to be and we weren't gonna cut corners in a sense um, because I mean, as with anything, uh, you always have some type of give and take. And when you're dealing with an entire school district and there's a lot of ins and outs as far as what they need for that year, um, sometimes your ideas get shuffled to the bottom, but you have to justify it and overcome uh, that obstacle to make sure that you're staying on the ball. Okay, so what advice do you have for someone who is interested in helping youth in some educational fashion with agriculture, whether that's through school districts or through other independent organizations, what advice do you have for them? I would say go into it with open eyes and well intentions. Um, if you're doing this for the money or, you're, or you've got some all, you know, other ulterior motives, uh, it's going to hinder your ability to um, effectively accomplish your, your goals. Um, you really want to go into something like this with being an altruistic person and saying, hey, you know, the main concern of what I'm trying to accomplish isn't necessarily for personal gain or for gain. 
to say, hey, this is for the kiddos and we need to keep that keep that in mind. Well, awesome. Thank you very much. So shifting gears back to like how you've diversified and done so many different things there. When mm -hmm. you look at what your next move is, is this something where you decide that kind of right away when you see a problem or do you kind of have like a list? I mean, I know your wife's a part of the operation too and whoever else is a part, do you guys have like a list of like dreams or potential options where you can diversify when the time is right or how do you make that decision? So it is just me and my wife and then one employee out here. So it's, it's pretty easy to get a meeting of the minds at times. Um, I think that we have some really, really big dreams. Um, but I wouldn't per se say we have a list of things. I think that, you know, learning what we've learned over this, this past year with all of the change and, you know, dynamics of, of legislation uh, have kept us adaptable and not so fixed on, on one thing. We have kind of like a general thing that we would like to accomplish and we formulate that vision as it gets built out. Um, but yeah, I think that we would like to build out the, that chef collaborative because I see there's a future in that, um, and really cultivate those relationships to where, you know, when restaurants do come back online, uh, we give those restaurants the ability to take their consumers out to the ranch and say, hey, this is where your food comes from. Let us educate you from the on the ground position uh, and, and give you a taste of what you've been missing. Because when you go to these Cisco's and uh, you know, U.S. foods and things like that, the national uh, hacker suppliers, distributors, um, there's a disconnection. You know, uh, you don't get to see where it's from. You don't get to see what was done to it or anything like that. You have no background, no transparency. Um, and for a lot of these restaurants and, and a lot of these supply chains now, uh, that's kind of what I've been noticing more and probably where our, our point of focus is going to be more directed to is these uh, more regionalized supply chains. So the other thing that I'm doing for the DISD is um, building out a book of business so that they can um, go out if there was ever a national shutdown again, uh, they couldn't source from US Foods or Cisco or something like that. They could then whip out this book of business and say, okay, we need beef, we need chicken, we need eggs, you know, and find all of their proteins, vegetables and fruits from a localized area. Um, and I hope to take that model and extrapolate it out across the nation to where we're increasing the the nutritional diversity of assisted lunch programs. So that's kind of my, my uh, arm's length goal uh, is to get involved with the, the assisted lunch programs and really have an impact on that on a larger scale. Um, but that requires working with uh, the government. So currently we're, um, we brought that up to Senator Bob Hall and um, we'll discuss that further as it, as it develops. Well, that's outstanding. So as we wrap up here today, um, you really did a thorough job explaining everything you do. And so is there anything else you'd really like to add or share? Um, well, if y'all ever want to come out to Happy Hollow Ranch for our doors always open and uh, we, we love to host people, um, keep up with us on Instagram at happyhollowbeef.com or <laughs> happyhollow.beef. And uh, happyhollowbeef.com is our website. So you can go on and order a, a package of curated beef or drop me a line. But it was an absolute pleasure uh, doing this interview. And thank you so much for bringing me on. Um, I think that this is fantastic. You ask great questions. And I really appreciate the robust conversation. And that's a wrap on that one. And I just want to remind you that bull sale season is fast approaching. So it's a good time to evaluate if your promotion is effective. Ask yourself these questions. Is your bull sale as successful as you had hoped? Are you skeptical if anyone sees your ads? Have you analyzed and adjusted your promotional budget this year? Many factors can make seed stock producers nervous before their sale. They simply worry that no one will show up and raise their hand when the auction starts. Take the guesswork out of promoting your bull sale. The Catalyst Hybrid Media Strategy revolutionizes promotion and elevates you above the competition.
The tactics and practices help you build long-lasting relationships with your current customers plus attract new buyers. The Catalyst strategy even takes the pain out of writing those dreaded footnotes when it comes to catalog time. If you want to spur success of your bull sale, head over to cowcamppromotions.com and schedule a time to visit. Thank you for tuning in again. Thank you, Brandon, for sharing your story with this audience. And thank you, Tracy, for sponsoring this episode and bringing Catalyst to my audience. Please remember to go check out my website, casualcattleconversations.com, or go to the show notes to learn how to gain access to exclusive content, partner with me, and have new episodes and blogs sent straight to your inbox. Remember to follow Cattle Convos on social media as well. Did you catch all that? And by the way, folks, if you don't know what the show notes are, I have them for each episode. So in the show notes is the description, it's the description of each episode. So you can find links to the advertiser for each show, special offers, and a quick three minute survey that will help you make this podcast yours and produce the content you want to hear. So go check that out and let me know what episodes you want. Take care and have a great day.